On this next episode of South Hall Computing, we're going to be building a Coffee Lake Hackintosh, and that's coming up next. <laughs> Warning, the following video is performed by a trained professional. It is meant for educational purposes only. Please do not attempt to try anything you see here. Enjoy. What's going on YouTube? Dan from South Hawk Computing here, and today we're gonna to be building a Hackintosh. I've done uh, quite a few of these in my time, at least I wanna say about a good seven. I had a Sandy Bridge Hackintosh for the longest time, and I unfortunately made the jump to a used Dell Precision 3600 as a Hackintosh because I wanted the capability for more processors. Unfortunately, the Dell Precision T3600 was nothing but headaches. I couldn't get the sound drivers to work. I had to use a USB sound card. It wasn't always the most stable thing to use that particular device, but as luck would have it, I was able to scrape enough funds up to build a new one. So we'll have a complete listing on our forums of what parts we used in this build. And for right now, what we're going to do is assemble the motherboard, processor, and aftermarket cooler right over there. So let's get to it. And then after that, we'll throw it in the case. So here we are, the motherboard and aftermarket CPU cooler. I'm going to basically unbox them both real fast. I went with this particular brand only because, for motherboard that is, I wanted something that had a optical out for audio and I also wanted USB 3 and 2. You, know, you never know when you get into a certain situation when you're building a Hackintosh and all of a sudden your USB devices don't work because you don't have the right driver. So didn't want to take that chance and let's get to it. Let's unbox these guys. It's like new car smell. So this Gigabit motherboard came with some SATA cables, two sets of two, hooking up the pins for lights and all that fun stuff uh, adapter, which is cool so you don't have to plug it right into the motherboard. Back panel, driver installation CD, a multi-language installation guide, and the manual. So we'll be consulting this uh, a couple of times for especially where we need to plug things in from the case. Have a look at what the aftermarket cooler has to offer us. You always want to make sure you put the cooler on first. You don't want to be in a situation where you've installed the motherboard into the case and find, come to find out you need to get to the back of the motherboard to, ins to install some sort of support bracket. So let's see what we got in the aftermarket cooler box. You gotta give it to these guys. They definitely put a lot of protection foam inside these boxes here. Wow, just look at this thing. It's freaking massive. You better keep the CPU cool. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. This looks like it fits on the back of the motherboard to uh, add support for <laughs> these guys here so we could get that CPU cooler installed. So again, never install the motherboard until the CPU, RAM, and heatsink are installed first. found the correct directions because they had two different sockets that they supported but we're looking at the LG 1150X so I was pretty much spot on with installing that bracket in the back of the motherboard first all right let's give this a try so apparently they want to match the cutouts here so there's one two three and as well as three in the back plane here so I'm gonna match that up when I pass it through So a little side note here, the manufacturer wanted these brackets along the sides. When you do that, that means the heatsink itself has to be mounted like this. The problem with that is when it's installed, it actually blocks not one, but two of the PCI slots on the motherboard. Don't do it. Don't, don't, don't listen to the recommendations from these guys. Mount these brackets in this position so the fan is sitting like this 
and you could still retain functionality of pretty much both of these PCI slots on your motherboard here. All right, let's try to get this guy on. So really quickly, here's our Rosewell case that has plenty of airflow in the front. And it looks like only one five and a quarter spot for a CD drive and a three and a half for whatever. Actually, no, it looks like you could do two five and a quarters if you really wanted to. On the top of the case here, we have, starting from the left, a high and low speed for the fans for the internal case. We have three USB 2 ports, two USB 3 ports, a headphone jack, microphone jack, a reset and hard drive LED light, it's a combo kind of thing, and a power as well as power light LED. So let's get this guy mounted. Okay, so this uh, motherboard is securely mounted into the case. Next up is the power supply. So before we do anything, we're going to give it some power and make sure we get a bio screen. So let's test it out. Okay, moment of truth time. Give it some power. Uh, power supply switch is on. And in the power button. Oof. So a couple things you want to do right away um, starting up a new computer. You go to save and exit in the BIOS. You want to double click on load optimize defaults. You're going to say yes to that as well as go to peripherals, USB configuration and make sure the XHCI handoff is enabled and go to save and exit and save and exit setup. Save the configuration, yes. So now that we know this thing will successfully boot up, we could start setting up our Mac OS USB partition. All right, so there's a couple things you wanna to do to get the installation on a USB for Mac OS High Sierra. First step, you wanna to go to your Apple App Store and download a copy of Mac OS High Sierra. Now for my installation, I'm going with the Tony Mac version. And here we have the Unibees 8.32 installer that will automatically take my copy from the Mac Apple Store here and make it a bootable USB drive. So I've already downloaded that as well as something called MultiBeast that we'll be using later once we have it installed on our Hackintosh. So once these are both downloaded, which I've already done, I'm going to run Unibeast. And basically we're just gonna keep on hitting continue. Continue, 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 agree. Oh, so because I had information on this USB stick, we're gonna format that real quick. I'm gonna say rescan, and now it sees my USB stick. I'm gonna hit continue, I'm gonna select High Sierra, and now I'm gonna hit continue. I'm gonna go for the UEFI boot mode and press continue. So I'm not gonna select any of these guys here because we are not gonna be using an old graphics card. So we're gonna hit continue. And this one here is basically verifying our selection. We have our USB stick selected. We're gonna do a high Sierra installation on the USB and we are gonna do the UEFI boot mode. And let's continue. So now this is gonna take a while. Sit back, relax, and let the installer do its job. So we saw that took a little while. Let's head over back to the Hackintosh build and see if we could get it to boot. I am ready to uh, power this thing up. I have the USB stick installer put in and the SATA drive is hooked up to SATA 1 or 0, I believe. So let's see what happens. So that's pretty cool. It automatically booted on the USB stick and basically I'm going to select the High Sierra install. So let's go.
So we're going to hit next, or the next arrow, and we're going to run disk utility because we want to format the SSD. And it was a previous Mac partition, but that's okay. I'm just going to blast that out real quick. So now I'm going back to the top of the screen here, disk utility, quit disk utility, and I'm going to say install Mac OS. Going to continue, agree, agree, select the drive that I just formatted, and install. And here we go. Looks like it rebooted, but let's see what happens when we select the HSF partition. Okay, part two of the installation. It looks like the installation is completed and we are still booted off the USB bootable device here. And if you notice, now we have a lot more partitions. So we want, this is the partition that we're looking for. Boot Mac OS from Mac OS HD. That's the partition or that is the drive that we installed Mac OS onto. Let's see if we could actually get it to boot without putting any uh, extra commands in. Okay, so it definitely booted into the standard installation screen here. So we are going to pick our region here. So I got the infamous uh, spin wheel uh, for a little bit, but it eventually came back and we got down to United States and we're going to hit continue. And basically that's our keyboard, US local ethernet. Okay, that'll be interesting to see if this machine actually sees the ethernet without installing any drivers. Sure. Just so you know, there is no ethernet cord currently plugged in. We already know it's not connected, so we're just gonna hit continue. Data policies, continue. Don't transfer anything. Agreement, yes, we agree. Uh, I'm just gonna call it Dan. Okay, we're gonna customize this setup. Um, no, we're not gonna allow that. And we wanna set our time zone. Sure, close enough. Nope, nope, and continue. And not bad, we're actually booted into macOS. It's asking about our keyboard currently, so we're just gonna say continue, and follow the prompts. Okay, so the million dollar question right now is what kind of drivers are missing? So let's see, right out of the gate. So according to this, it does see the ethernet card that's built in. So let's have a go and see what exactly, if we have to do anything to get it to work. Wow, well that's a first. I don't think out of all the Hackintoshes I ever built, that has to be the first one that I did not have to install drivers for. Okay, we do have to do the graphics card. Pretty sure we need to do sound card drivers. Yep, we gotta do the sound card driver, which is not a big deal. So that was interesting. So I just plugged in this USB stick into a 3.0 USB port and it worked right out of the box. Yet again, I'm impressed on how remarkably easy this is because it never goes this way. I'm going to install some drivers next. So I uh, put a folder here labeled drivers. This one here is the NVIDIA graphics set. Works for any Pascal based cards. Right now we have a GTX 680 in there. We'll be eventually moving to the 10 series, but once it's installed, we won't have to do anything. But first we got to get the bootloader launched. So let's get the multi-beast installation going here. So I'm going to quick start, click on the UEFI mode bootloader, because that's the one we want. I'm going to go to drivers, and this one has a ALC 1220. So audio. ALC 1220, very good. Don't need to do the network card drivers because that's fine. I'm not gonna mess with that since everything is working. Network, I'm not touching that either. I'm just gonna take a quick peek in there, but that's fine. 
USB seems like it's working as well. Okay, it's gonna use that for the bootloader. Customize. You don't need to play with any of this. We're gonna leave it as the iMac 4.2 definition, the late 2013 model, because it seems to behave itself. Next up, we're gonna hit build. Recaps everything we want. Bootloader, sound card drivers, and everything else that goes in, and let's hit install. Okay, so the bootloader is installed. Let's install the NVIDIA graphics card drivers. Ooh, what is this? Okay, so apparently I downloaded the wrong driver for the graphics card, so let's try that one more time. There was two different versions of 10, was it, Mac OS 10.13.4. So let's try this one. Yeah, it looks like it's actually gonna work. Cool. I should note that the USB 3.1 port is also working, so kudos for that as well. Okay, so the graphic card uh, drivers are done. This is the moment of truth time. We're gonna reboot, unplug the USB stick that we had there with the bootloader and see what happens. Okay, I'm not selecting anything. It's doing it all automatically. So far, so good. Okay, graphic card drivers appear to be working now. Uh, we're loaded. We're gonna check on sound. Aha, uh -huh. so we do have to install something for this Ethernet driver, so we'll go back and do that in a little bit. How's the sound card looking? There's no sound card driver either. Interesting. Okay, all right. Well, we'll have to go back and see what we did wrong. We'll be back. Okay, so the last piece of this puzzle here is the audio drivers. They, uh, they were a bit of a pain, but apparently using the Voodoo HDA 2.9.0 D10 did eventually get it to work. Holly freaking Loya. And there you have it, folks. We got ourselves a working 8th generation Coffee Lake CPU running Mac OS High Sierra. If you like what you see here, obviously give this video a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also subscribe to our forums. It would be greatly appreciated. This is Dan from South Hawk Computing, and as always, folks, until the next time.